And fortunately, we have a solution. We'll talk more about this in chapter three, this notion that neurons actually have graded responses to inputs. You don't just have binary firing. We talk in general, conceptually, we think about a detector as being a binary event. You either detect it or not. But in fact, neurons fire and respond to stimuli at different rates. And we'll actually look at that in detail in the next section here. Um, and so that graded response allows a much more efficient encoding of information. We only have three different detectors in our retina. We have uh, a very long wavelength, a medium wavelength, which is, so the long wavelength, wavelength is red, medium wavelength is green. And in fact, interestingly, if you look at the real data, these things are really, really close together in the kind of frequency dimension. And then you have a short wavelength, which is the blue. And so with only three, you can actually encode an entire continuous dimension. I think of it as fighting combinatorics with combinatorics. So you take a problem and you represent, you come up with a combinatorial code, a very efficient way of representing this overall uh, dimen continuous dimension through combinations of these basic detectors. So a particular shade of in between red and green, which is gonna be some version of yellow, um, that will uh, be a particular rate of firing of each of those guys. Okay, so that's what we need to think about when we're thinking about our detectors. They're not just like single binary detectors. They're really kind of carving up the world into these kind of graded domains and encoding, say, some part, some region of that space. And in fact, a way we can think about that is in the language of linear algebra. Some of you may have experience with linear algebra, some of you may not. If you don't, don't worry about it. Um, but if you do, it's a very powerful kind of metaphor to think about what really is going on when we think about detection. It's essentially projecting a, uh, a input space, a high dimensional input space. And on the left here, we're thinking about just, you know, uh, a bunch of face pictures of people's faces. And that encoded in your visual system is many, many different pixels. Um, each having different values, and each pixel is essentially a different dimension in the input space. Um, and so each individual person with a particular expression occupies a particular point in this very high dimensional space, a particular image of that person with a particular expression. And what we really want to do, though, is not, you know, think about this really high dimensional space. Again, we want to compress it down and extract the most behaviorally relevant dimensions and again, that's what detection is doing. It's, it's pulling out the relevant dimension of interest in the input. And so you'll see in chapter three, when we go through the face categorization model, that this particular weight vector, we'll talk about weights in a second, the synaptic inputs uh, into a neuron, um, filter this high dimensional space and essentially project that high dimensional uh, set of inputs onto a new dimension, a new basis for representing that, that high dimensional space. And so you can think about this as a vector space. This is a particular dimension or basis function that you're projecting that space onto. And as you can see here, when you do that, it separates out the happy faces on the top of this display separate from the sad faces on the bottom of the display. And that is, you know, really very useful for uh, relating to different people, understanding what kind of state they're in, having that ability to represent happy versus sad, regardless of what person who you're looking at, what their gender is, et cetera, just having a, a kind of common canonical uh, representation of emotion is extremely useful. And then in this <clears throat> particular example, the x-axis is actually representing uh, whether they're female or male in appearance, um, so the gender dimension, um, and so the same principle applies there. And so you can basically rotate um, this original space of pixels into a much more useful, organized, structured space that is detecting behaviorally relevant dimensions 
through this mathematical process of projecting through the weight vector. And that's another way of thinking about what a uh, neuron is doing in the brain. And it's a more kind of continuous way of thinking about the detection process um, rather than this kind of discrete, is it there or not? It's more continuous, like transforming the input space into a different rotation of that high dimensional space um, onto axes or dimensions that are much more behaviorally relevant. So that's a different way of thinking about it.